So, Jay, welcome again. Thank you, once again. Uh, I'd like to just start by going back. Um, anyone who uh, argues that zoning and approval of site plans to maximize the dollar per acre of downtown property, in my judgment, is taking a very, very narrow view of it. It's uh, a little like when um, Jane Jacobs was uh, going to doing battle with Robert Moses in New York, where he wanted to build throughways uh, through the uh, uh, the West Village. The East, excuse me, the East Village. Uh, he wanted to extend the the uh, Bronx uh, freeway. Uh, you you do not get the kind of uses that will make people want to live in East Lansing and visit downtown by pursuing a, a tactic of um, maximizing the dollars per acre of real estate. That's why there's nobody in this space at this time that Kosi occupied, uh, because the, the, the rents become so high that mostly only um, major chains can afford them. And uh, if building up was an environmental necessity, then why wasn't Virginia Street a, a build a high rise project? It was because people wouldn't want to live in a high rise building in that location. Now let's get back to the development agreement. The first question is, how does this project get off the ground? Because, as I understand a letter from a bond council that's in the file, um, the, uh, the, the Brownfield uh, Redevelopment Finance Act doesn't permit the Brownfield Authority to issue bonds until the project is finished. So where does the dollars come from to get this project off the ground? And uh, where does the money come from to pay, assuming that involves some somebody issuing a bond, where does the money come from to pay that bond? Um, now, there's been a lot of discussion about, well, you know, we put all the protections into the development agreement that we can conceive of, and in the, the development agreement draft with today's date on it, there are a couple of protections in there that I think would be just wonderful, but I can't imagine that the developers uh, attorney is going to agree to. Um, the, all the ideas about the developer backing up the, the, any difference between the TIF revenues and the, the bond obligation uh, is, assumes that the developer is going to be there. And again, the developer is a standalone LLC. They're in a position, if things go south, to walk away. And then who's going to pay the bonds? Nobody is going to pay the bonds. So, uh, and, and the only other thing I'll mention about the development agreement, which, which I, I think uh, shows uh, a, a tremendous effort uh, in, in drafting that, that agreement. The only other thing, two things I would say is that one, the, um, the, the development agreement calls for the developer to make an annual payment of $200,000. Um, the, the lease, the, the, uh, the ground lease instead um, there's several problems with the ground lease. For, for one thing, it starts out referring to the lessee without, lessee without any specification of who the lessee is. And then at the end of the ground lease, it, it, instead of lessee, at the end of the ground lease, it's the tenant. But the real problem is that in the, in the ground lease, the obligation to, to pay rent, first of all, totals only $150,000. And secondly, the obligation is placed on someone called someone called unit owners and the only obligation 
on the lessee, which presumably is the developer, is to cause the unit owners to make those payments without any requirement that the uh, lessee or developer uh, guarantee those payments. So uh, that's that's the the second point, and. Um, And a little story. Back in back in the early 70s, I was counsel to the, just out of law school, I was counsel to the Detroit City Council when Carl Levin was the council president. And uh, I was asked by the council to review the documentation for the construction of the Joe Louis Arena. And so uh, I worked with the Olympia people who were going to lease it and manage it um, and reviewed the documents. And back then, that was about a hundred million dollar deal, which today is probably probably five, six, seven hundred million. Uh, that was child's play compared to this. Agreements of purchase and sale that I have litigated involving Fortune 500 companies, child's play compared to this. This is uh, highly risky, most likely to end up in in litigation. And the city, historically, is very litigation-averse. So, I, I, despite your optimism, I, I think you're headed down the wrong, the wrong road. Thank you. Quick, yeah. the, the $150,000 obligation, what, what, this is in the ground lease? Yeah, in the ground lease, there are two. The ground lease breaks out who's make, who is supposed to make these payments. Uh, one of the uh, unit owners is supposed to pay 60 and the other 90. Oh, okay. So it's, you're adding the 60 and the 90 to get the... Right. Okay. All right. I found those numbers. Thank you.